Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Living Web. Thanks so much for being here this evening. Let me know in the chat if our audio is good. Please let me know. Sometimes we have audio issues and this is a whole new setup and we're getting used to it and our multimedia is doing great at getting all these kinks out, but let me know in the chat if we're good on sound. Are we still good? Good? Okay. Well, welcome to the modern Victory Day garden. I think now than ever, it makes more sense to grow a garden. There's so many reasons to grow a garden. Just, uh, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions tonight, and I hope you answer me in the chat. Let me know who out there is growing a garden this year. It's, uh, we're in the perfect season for it. It's been warm and dry here. Plants are growing like mad. We certainly need a little water, but we're off to the races. It's a great gardening season. We have lots of plants in. Things are looking good. I hope you all have your garden. If not, now has never been a better time to start a garden. Um, and there are many reasons to start a victory garden. Food security is a huge one. It seems as if we are in the perfect storm. We have supply chain issues, and these have really compiled since COVID and farmers are having a hard time getting parts, getting tires for their tractors. Um, certainly a lot of us had heard about the fertilizer uh, shortages around the world. It's harder for big farmers to get fertilizer. On top of that, extreme, extreme water shortages. Out west, it's some of the driest that it's been in 40, 50 years. Snowpack is very thin and the reservoirs are already very low. So it seems as if we are heading into a time when we can expect um, more problems with supply chain, less um, less food in the grocery store. We've all seen that. And who has gone into the grocery store and seen the prices increase? I know I have. Inflation is at a 40 year high as well. And food prices year over year are at least eight to 10% higher than last year. So it's incredibly high and it's just rising and we're just now seeing this. So as time goes on, inflation, um, high inflation doesn't go away right away. It takes time. So that's what we're up against. And we really want to be sustainable. We want to be able to feed our families. We want to be able to afford to feed our families. And so it, like I said, it's never, it's been a better time than now to start a garden. There's so many reasons to grow your victory garden. There's so many personal victories that you can have. And um, health-wise, gardening is incredible. There's too many benefits to even start to list here with gardening. But the science is overwhelming. And doctors are now prescribing gardening as medicine. Um, vitamin D, when you get out in the sunshine, is incredibly, incredibly important. Vitamin D is essential for hundreds of processes in the body. Um, it lowers the risk of all sorts of diseases, having proper levels of vitamin D. Um, as far as exercise, believe it or not, gardening is incredible exercise for you. Um, out there, hoeing or raking can be considered light to moderate exercise. And shoveling, digging, 
chopping wood, that could be considered moderate to vigorous exercise. So you can get a real workout in the garden. Um, there's so many benefits. Increased sleep, increased mood. There are microbes that live in the soil and when you get them under your nails, they enter your body, not from your nails, but eventually they get into your, your gut flora and they actually have been found to stimulate the release of serotonin in the brain. So we're happier, we sleep better, we're healthier, our memory increases. There's just so many reasons to start your garden. Now's the, now's the time. And I think um, certainly flavor is a big one. If you've ever gone out into your garden in the middle of summer and harvested a real tomato, you know that flavor is there. The French have a word for it, it's called terroir. And it, it is really a combination of all your practices in the garden and everything you do, from your management practices, your horticultural practices, the soil, the season, how you water, your attitude, the harvest, all that goes into creating these very complex aromatic oils that are in the foods. And flavor really matters. We don't, we don't know that anymore because we've lost so much of that, but it is time. Also, to me, I think with, um, with the COVID and a lot of people staying at home and a lot of people deciding they're gonna work from home, it's a great time to start a garden. You can certainly start a garden as a hobby and grow it into an actual career. Everybody needs to eat. That's one thing about food. It binds all of us. And with the increased shortages, there's increased demand. And if you can grow quality food, you can always sell it. The sixth one on my list here is a big one for me. Um, and this may be the biggest one, I don't know. I mean, they all kind of, they all tie together and they all dovetail together here. But essentially, community building, the garden is a great place for community building. Like I said, food connects all of us. We all have to eat. If we save seed, we grow together, we grow plants, we can teach our neighbors how to grow. It's a great place to develop a community. This is my mom. This is Louisa. She's awesome. Um, I wanted to incorporate this in here because about uh, 10 years ago, my wife and I helped her build her victory garden. She's got maybe 10 or 12 years with her victory garden. And I'm gonna use her garden as an example of what you can do. Our strategy for Victory Garden name is we want to think about time. Time is very essential. What we want to do is to quickly spin up or ramp up our food production. We also, on top of that, we want to harmonize and harness the energies coming into our yard. Essentially, plants grow by very simple, the sunlight coming into your space, the rain coming down, and the soil. In the atmosphere, 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. So plants take in what they need, and it's our job to try to harness that energy coming into the system. Let me know if you got any questions out there. What to plant? I think a good place to start is, is probably researching and studying what was traditionally grown in your area for long periods of time. Those crops are crops that grow well, that can endure weather extremes. 
are totally acclimated to our climates. And generally, the people who grew these traditional crops grew them together to where they had a perfect balance of proteins, carbohydrates, and nutrients that they needed. So a good place to start is traditionally grown crops in your area. For us, it could be in this area, at Western North Carolina, um, the Cherokee grew three sisters and some of us say three sisters, Pet Battle says three sisters and all the relatives because it was more than just three different types of plants grown together. But the simplified version is um, a high protein corn. And we really are, corns these days are not high protein. They're high in carbs, but not high in protein. But a high protein corn, winter squash, and beans together. The beans climb up the corn stalk and the squash work their way out underneath the corn. They suppress weeds and it's a perfect system that works together. There's many other crops that can be grown with that, but that's, that's um, one strategy to think about. You certainly wanna grow nutrient dense crops in your victory garden. Um, some nutrient dense crops are um, kale, could be sweet potatoes, carrots, um, tomatoes have lots of nutrients in it, lots of vitamins, garlic, spinach, uh, beans, peppers, there's a whole list of nutrient dense crops you can grow. So that's on the one side. And if you research this, people will tell you, well, what you really want is carbs. You really want to grow all carbs because that will get you through the winter. And in some cases, that's true. If you're to grow an acre of corn, that could sustain you for 19 years if it was just the carbs that you needed. But we need lots of other nutrients. So we need a mixture of crops. Rapid crops, crops like lettuce. You can grow a crop of lettuce or arugula or um, radishes. And you could get a crop essentially in 30 to 45 days from any of those crops. So that's rapid crops and that balances out. And you're not only growing for carbs, you need to grow for nutrition and balance. You also need to grow for flavor and grow things that you and your family will actually enjoy to eat. So on the one side, you've got the rapid crops. And the other side, you wanna think about the storage crops. Storage crops take more space up in your garden and they take longer to produce. But these crops will store through the winter. Things like sweet potatoes. I just grabbed one here. Here's one. This is a purple sweet potato. We grow these. It's a beautiful Japanese sweet potatoes. And you can actually easily propagate off of these. If you put this under a little soil or put it in water, it'll send off shoots. And you could propagate off of this. One of these, you could probably get 50 plants off of. So every year, we save sweet potatoes and we start our own slips. It's easy, it doesn't cost you anything. And sweet potatoes will get you through the winter. They last, they'll last probably properly stored They'll last almost a year, but it's, it's more of a winter crop. And probably by late spring, early summer, there's so many other crops coming into your, coming out from the garden that you really wouldn't want to eat sweet potatoes too much longer. They're a winter crop. 
potatoes. Everybody grows potatoes. Very, um, very easy to grow. Not a whole lot of complex nutrients in them. But they are a traditional crop that has got people through many years. Um, the Peruvians have thousands of different types of potatoes that grow at different altitudes. Some grow with less water, some like more water. Very interesting. But potatoes are super easy to grow. Winter squash, that's a great one. You can save all your seed from winter squash and plant them out the next spring. Um, carrots, beets, cabbage. Cabbage is a huge one. Cabbage grows great in our climates. Cabbage, you can get two crops a year. You can get a spring cabbage that's essentially plant in spring and harvest in late spring or early summer. And you can get a fall planting of cabbage that you harvest late fall in winter. Cabbage is a great one because you can make sauerkraut and kimchi. And these are all traditional methods that will get you through the winter. I Yesterday I went home and opened up a jar of kimchi that was two years old. And it was delicious. Amazing. So kimchi lasts. You have to refrigerate it. But kimchi will last years and years and years. And the older it gets the better it gets. Captain Cook went around the world and didn't get scurvy because he took sauerkraut, he took barrels of sauerkraut with him. And I think he went, I think it, he went around the world, I think it took two years, I'm not sure about that. Um, and he got back around, all the way around the world and got to Portugal and he still had sauerkraut that was good with him. He ended up giving a dignitary one or two of the leftover barrels of sauerkraut um, in Portugal when he made it back. Very interesting. So think about crops that you can get you through the winter and also crops that you can, you can uh, process, like the sauerkraut, um, tomatoes. Obviously, you can can tomatoes. I'm still working on tomato sauce. Um, that me and my wife made during COVID. We put up, oh, I don't know how many quarts, but lots of quarts of tomato sauce. And I, uh, anytime I want to make a chili or something like that, I just break out a quart of tomato sauce, add that. It's so easy. It takes time. It takes energy to do. But these are traditional methods that our parents and our grandparents have used to get through the winter and get through hard times. What else to plant? Um, I want you to always think about devoting enough space to culinary herbs. I've got 10% on here. You may not need 10%. You only need a few herbs to really be successful in your garden. I mean, not a, you can use a lot, you can have a lot of variety, but herbs pack a punch and you don't need many of each one to make a big impact on your variety. Um, culinary and medicinal, chives, culinary, um, rosemary, oregano, thyme, all those things are very good for you and a lot of them are very medicinal for you. Medicinal plants that you can grow in your garden, um, echinacea, Stinging nettles, very good for you. Um, lots of medicinals you can grow in your garden and you can use for a multitude of things. Also, with times potentially being hard for a lot of people, we may want to think about planting an extra row. Lots of people I know um, would love a little boost of plants, of fruit, of vegetables. So if we just 
plant one extra row in our garden, we can donate that. This is what excites me about everything. I am a designer. Um, I think good design is so critical. Good design to me has five or six real key elements. Good design usually solves a problem. It could be erosion. Um, it could be inefficiencies. Good design solves problems. And good design also is beautiful. So I want you to think about that in your gardens and how you develop a piece of land. And what we really want to do is get this very wide perspective on our garden. We kind of want to get a bird's eye view and we want to get above it. We want to take the whole piece of land that we have into account. And I'm visualizing that a lot of these gardens are small gardens. My mom's garden, it's a small garden. It's not even a tenth of an acre. So it's very important when you have a small piece of land to get the design right. So very important to orientate your gardens to contour. What is contour? Contour is, is level. Contour is not straight. Contour is straight in one sense that it's level, but contours on a landscape are very curved. There's curves in nature. And if we go along, because here in Western North Carolina, we're in the mountains. I would say at least 50%, could be 75 or 80% of people's gardens, it could be even more than that, are on slopes, even mild slopes. Um, we wanna orientate our gardens to contour. So this prevents erosion and it's much easier to work on a garden that is on contour. The next big one is we want to think about solar gain. You want at least a minimum of six hours a day of sunlight coming into your garden. So you will t pick a spot that you have a minimum of six hours and you start studying that. You need that sun. The sun is the engine that runs everything on this planet. Do you think we could do a little um, whiteboard? I'm having a hard time describing this without drawing it. Let's just try it. If not, we'll... We're going to try to do the whiteboard here. So this is looking down. So if we were bird's eye view, we're looking down at our piece of property here. This is a straight line. In nature, there are really no straight lines. Um, this is a level plane. Contour may look like this. This is, this is flat. This is level. So this could be a piece of property. This may be your piece of property right here. And this is what you have. And this could be your house right here. And the way they cut up lots generally are square. And they don't worry about contour when they divide lots and survey them. 
But for us, we need to care about this because this is where our garden's going to go. So contour would look something like this on this piece of property. And maybe the, the house is built out with an apron around it, and it's essentially level. But this could be going downhill here. And this could be south. Let's say, actually, let's reverse that. Let's say this is south and this is north. So we want to pick a spot, and obviously for this, this diagram here, this looks like our best area because it's, it's long and somewhat flat. And if you were to read a map, these are called um, contour lines on the map. And often they're 5 or 10 or 20 feet above each other. Um, you can get a more detailed map, and you can get a survey, and you may have a contour line that's only a foot or two above each other. So if this, this could be the lowest spot, and this is higher. So this could, if these were one foot contours, this would be one. So here we're two foot higher than here. And here we're three foot higher and four foot higher. And this area is essentially flat in this area. So we're going to choose this for our garden area in this instance. And just so happens we've got great solar gain here. Um, sun's coming in this way, this is pretty easy. So we could either terrace this, which would be nice. Maybe our terraces, and your terraces will have to follow contour, because you want your terraces to essentially to be flat and harmonize with contour. And even though this is a slope and it's hard to work on, this way, this way you can flatten this and it's very easy to work on your garden. This is a great area to have a garden. So we're going to pretend this is more organic. Some people may want their gardens to be more um, square and straight, but right now we're just harmonizing with this piece of land. So our garden, our garden rows could be something like this. And they're nice and long in that. Nice and long rows here. We've got plenty of sun. Maybe this is the road here. If you're in a neighborhood, sunlight's coming in. You're getting six or eight hours here. Maybe you have some big trees here. The morning light could be blocked a little bit. But that's a basic setup of contour. So that's just, that's just a simple way of looking at contour. One example, but this is pretty much what we see with houses in our area. They're on slope and we have to learn to work with them. Um, terraces will look like this on your land. If this is the side angle, if we're looking at the side of this piece of land, maybe it's not that steep. Maybe it's only this steep. And this could be the house. Um, could be here. Something like this. And we may decide that we want to flatten this out a bit, so maybe we create a set of terraces here to garden on. And this is essentially the same layout of this, the last example. So we may have to terrace to have useful land. And this all takes time, um, but you want to get your mainframe, your big things right. Even if this year you can't do the terraces, you want to plan to do this right and take on this over time. To get your garden going, 
you know, you're going to work from zero. I would say zone zero in permaculture, we work with zones. And zone zero is kind of the house, it's the heart. Zone zero could be you. And you're working from zone zero and you're working outward. And maybe this year, all you can do is a small patio garden here. And maybe just potted plants. And maybe this is all you can do. There's an incredible amount of food that you can harvest off a small patio garden. And certainly the most productive lands are the small holder lands that are close to the home where people can take care of them daily. These are the, the most productive square foot, square yard, far more productive than broad agriculture. But this being our terraced example, if you have to terrace, it may look something like this. And this helps us harmonize. These terraces angle back slightly to the bank, 2% back, so the water doesn't run off this way. This is what we're trying to prevent, water running down the slopes of the terrace. If you angle this back, then the water, when it hits this, rainwater, it ends up pooling somewhat in here. In here. Maybe in here. And then we can run this around and run it out. And we can make these terraces permanent beds. Maybe if it's in an urban setting, maybe you build a wall here. Maybe you just plant this out with shrubs and herbaceous material. Maybe you plant it out with fruit trees. This whole area could be fruit trees. That's just a way of looking at it. But I want you to, I want you to think about harmonizing with your piece of land. And often we have to modify our piece of land because we have slope if we want a garden. Long rows are very important. We're looking down at this imaginary garden again. Maybe this one is, is on contour again. And here's our, just imagine this is our rose. Or maybe you're on a perfect flat piece and you can have this easy flat square garden. Nevertheless, you want to save space. You don't want to eat up your garden space with paths, laneways, access. You need access, you need paths, you need laneways, but you, you want as minimal space dedicated to that as you need. You want as much growth space as you can get out of this. So we'll just start with this bottom one because this is easy to recognize. A lot of people, what they do, they would put some rows here, and then maybe they have another section here, and they have some more rows, and then maybe they have a big space, and some more rows, like this. And all this space, you're only using this amount. If you eliminate the headspace, headspace in a garden is, is this unused space here or here or here. And we need some of that, um, especially if we scale up and we have equipment, you'll need to turn around. But long rows, you can eliminate a lot of this headspace and get more production area out. Long rows would go all the way down. 
and that's much more efficient also. You're gonna go down, work the entire row, you can come back, work it like this, and you're not wasting that space. If you're on contour, it's a similar kind of thing with the long rows. It would be like this. So long rows, less head space. Nice wide paths. I mean, nice wide beds, beds and narrow paths. You want basically your beds. You, you really want to do raised beds. Raised beds are very helpful in the garden. Raised beds do a lot of different things, but we're looking at the side of a raised bed right here. And this is where we would plant, plant our lettuces. And so maybe this is three or four foot wide here. It could be up to five foot wide even. And our path could be as little as one foot wide right here. Um, I've seen people have paths as big as two or three feet. And then in this instance, two beds and two paths, and you just lost a third of your garden. So it's very important to condense this to keep your beds close. If you're using a wheelbarrow, you need about 18 inches right here. You can get by with one foot though. Um, I'm not a big fan. This is a raised bed where the earth is raised. There's nothing that contains the side though. It may only be raised six inches. This could be up to a foot right here. I'm not a big fan of permanent raised beds where people try to raise this up so they don't have to bend down. This is a very tricky thing to do here um, because you end up with a large cost to do this. Lumber and material are very expensive. Um, often what people use is pressure treated wood build these raised beds or could be pressure treated wood and zinc metal that's going to react with the soil. Um, I'm not a huge fan of large raised beds because then you have to fill it and it limits future kind of your options. You're, you're really stuck into this once you build a raised bed. And after about four or five years, they start to rot away. Even the pressure treated these days don't, doesn't last. And you really don't want the pressure treated because it has chemicals in it and it gets in your soil. So I say, unless you have to, just to avoid these raised beds and do nice garden beds. So we want to think about our piece of land, and if it's limited, um, if we're, you know, in an urban setting, suburban setting, if we only have a small piece of land, we have to make use essentially of every inch of it. So we have this edge space all around it, and this edge space is great. We can we can plant perennials in this edge. And then we're gonna leave the center open and this is gonna be our garden. Very simple. We wouldn't wanna put perennials or big things in the center and then work around it the opposite. We wanna keep center open and edge space flowing. So there's a few options. We have, to, we have to work up the earth 
to plant into it. Most new gardeners that I know of, in this area at least, um, they go straight to the rototiller. And I, as a young farmer, have rototilled. And I've been farming for almost 30 years now. And I tell you, when you rototill the soil, it can work fine for the initial conversion of pasture or lawn or grass into a garden area. But what happens when you rototill and as soon as it rains, all the soil structure that you had is now powder. And when you rototilled it, it was beautiful. It was fluffy, it felt rich, it was great, easy to plant into. But the first rain, it all turns to concrete. All that soil structure is now broken up in its fine particles. And it's very hard to grow a good garden in concrete. It's very hard to grow a good garden when the soil's compacted. You really need that soil structure. So that's really what we're working with constantly is soil structure. So if possible, I say go the lazy method if you can. And this works great. You can, you can look up here. We've got a cover on this area here. You can use a silage tarp. Um, lots of people are using used billboard tarps as a cover. You can use cardboard. You can just use tarps. You can use canvas. Um, but when you cover the ground like that, the grasses and the perennial plants that were there end up dying off, but you don't disturb the soil structure, and that's very important. You want to keep that soil structure intact as long as you can. And if you put the cover down, especially now when it's starting to warm up, and before the plants are back into full growing, they've been, a lot of the plants have been dormant all winter, and they're coming out of dormancy now. If you put a cover on it, very hard on a lot of the plants. Um, they will die within two weeks to four weeks, certainly. Six weeks tops, you'll kill most of the uh, perennial weeds perennial plants in there. You'll still have some, some plants that are really tough. Mugwort could take six months. Um, we work with a lot of dock in our fields, yellow dock. And essentially, I think you could probably keep that stuff covered for six or eight months and you couldn't kill it. But essentially, you'll get rid of probably 99% of all your weeds, and you'll make your planting very easy if you just simply put a cover over it, cover over the space. If you don't have a cover and you have leaves, you can mulch. This is what we've done out at the farm. This has worked really great. Um, lots of urban settings, you can get leaves. I know in Asheville, you know, in the fall, people bag their leaves up and you'll see entire neighborhoods with multiple bags of leaves, bags and bags and bags loaded up. And in the past, we've been able to go around and collect those leaves when I was doing smaller gardening and use those for mulch. And that mulch works the same way as the uh, cover here. The mulch works just the same way. You just have to put it on a little bit thicker than the cover, but you get the same end result. The advantage of having the mulch is that you're adding an incredible amount of carbon to the soil. And the leaves, after um, one season, will be rotted down and your soil will be improved dramatically.
you will eliminate a lot of your perennial weeds by doing this. If you can't mulch or don't have time to mulch because you're too late in the season, you can double dig. And I don't want to talk a lot about double digging. Double digging is an incredible method that was created by um, Alan Chadwick, an incredible master English gardener. And um, it really works. It's beautiful. And you could look it up online. Um, but it's, it's a lot of work. And we want to be efficient with our time and our energy. And double digging, you will have the best results um, if you're in a hurry. But you will have to put the effort and some time into it. Um, a small garden, you can work up a couple beds in a few days, and it's not too bad. But anything more than probably 500 square feet, um, for most people, it's not, a, it's not an option. There's other ways to break new ground, but... Those are three of the main ways for a smaller garden that I think are the most efficient and effective. Let me know out there in the chat how you are uh, breaking up your garden this year. Hopefully you're uh, no-till and you don't have to break it up. A lot of the stuff we planted out in the garden so far, yeah, we've either had covers on or we've had cover crop. And now it's great. We've had the, uh, the steers out there, and they've been eating the cover crop. So they've been transforming that cover crop into fertility, and we'll be able to plant when they're finished. I'm telling you some of the major, major components that you will need to be successful. Um, I've know that a lot of people each year start a garden and if you lack any of the major points your garden is not going to be very productive and it's very easy to have a failed garden or a partially failed garden especially the first year or couple years and if you put a lot of effort into your garden but you miss a couple key points um, then often people get discouraged and don't think it's worth their time. And I want you to avoid that and I want you to have an incredible harvest. One of the best ways to have an incredible harvest is irrigation. Um, this, everybody knows this, but think about it. No plant will grow without water. Globally, irrigation increases yields 250%. It's incredible what irrigation can do. Um, if we were fortunate and had a perfect grow season, often, you know, maybe half the time we do and we, we don't have to irrigate, um, we would get an inch or two of rain a week, every week. And in our area, Mills River here, it's essentially, we get about an inch a week, the average. We're 47 inches to 50 inches, somewhere in there. So that's almost an inch a week on average. Right now, it's been incredibly hot and dry. So we just, we don't get that. And if you don't apply correct amount of water, your crops will certainly suffer. Um, this is one of the best and easiest things you can do is to pl apply water to your garden. Um, the water is an incredible, irrigation water is an incredible asset to what we do in farming. And globally, it has been a buffer against famine, against drought, when you can irrigate. And Often it's the difference of farmers living in poverty and being able to sustain their self. So it's very important. If you can, harvest your rainwater, harvest it off the roof, harvest it in your gutters, harvest it, store it in barrels, 
store it in containers, store it in the soil if you can. Adding all those leaves, if you add 1% organic matter to your soil per acre, you can store 16,000 gallons more water per acre. So that's huge. So water is key. Water is one of those keys that we cannot forget. One to two inches a week. Most plants are happy with that. And also we want to think about water as a delivery method here. We can use water to irrigate with. We can add um, compost extracts. We could add fish emulsions. We could add biodynamic preps. Um, Water is in a very efficient way of bringing in fertility to right to the root zone of the plants. So we got our water, we got our site, and we want to think about soil. Obviously, you're not going to grow a good garden without good soil. Soils take time to improve. But there's lots that you can do to work on your soils. And my, the way I look at it on the farm is every time we transition a crop is a time that I want to improve that soil. So every time I'm working with a crop, I'm thinking about how can I improve the soil? I'm either going to add compost, I may add um, silicas, rock minerals, things like that. Um, when I'm transitioning a crop to another crop, that's a great time to add compost to a soil. You're certainly going to improve your soils by cover cropping. Um, Patrick Battle had a great class a couple months ago on um, dynamic cover cropping and plants, and it's it's huge what cover crops do in farming and for soil health. Certainly, especially in the winter months when a lot of uh, gardens are bare, it's a great time to cover crop. Um, under sowing. So you may have a you may have a crop, your main crop that you're growing. And you could think about under sowing. Once your main crop gets up maybe six, four, six, eight inches, say it's cabbage or something like that, maybe it's this big, you can under sow that with clover in the spring or in the fall. And that clover will grow up, it will improve the soil, it'll hold that niche in the soil, that great little zone beneath these plants, it'll It'll hide the soil and protect it. And the soil will benefit, and certainly your main crop will benefit from that. If you're in your garden and it's compacted, compaction is one of the um, one of the hardest things to deal with to alleviate compaction in your garden. And a compacted garden will not grow good crops. It will not grow good crops at all in a compacted garden. So what to do? Well, it's easy. Get a fork. Get a good garden fork, and you could go out there and aerate it. You just put the fork in and pull it back, and you'll get just a little bit of a, a popping and lifting motion. And you don't actually mix the horizons, the soil horizons. They stay in the same spot, but you're able to alleviate that compaction. Your soil will actually lift up a little bit and you'll get, your plant's roots will penetrate farther. Um, water will penetrate into your soil better. Um, your soils will drain better and your plants will actually breathe better and grow better. It's very important. So I really want you to think about, especially with the supply chain shortages, the fertilizer shortages, I want us to think about 
the way things used to be created. And this really goes to regenerative farming. We're not going out for our fertility, especially in our victory garden, and buying a lot of fertility and bringing it home and applying it from bags. What we want to create is this living system that you can create your own fertility on your piece of land. Um, it's very important. And up until 100 years ago, that was essentially every farm had to have its own fertility machines. Your fertility machine can be different things, but it's essentially you're taking, you're taking, um, if you're composting, you're taking a waste product and you're turning it into black gold. Um, it could be compost. You can, if you don't have compost and you're in a hurry, look up the Berkeley method. There's a composting method called the Berkeley method and it's labor intensive, but you can have finished compost in 18 days. You turn it every day and in 18 days you'll have finished compost. You turn it once a day for 18 days. Um, you can make layered compost piles through the season. You get your leaves, you get um, soil mix that you started plants in. Maybe the plants died or you planted them out. You can add that to it. You can add your grass clippings. Um, you know, you could add your kitchen scraps, things like that, and make a layered compost pile. You could also have compost bins, worm bins. Worms are great. Worms are easy. Worms are one of the best things you can do at home. Red wigglers, um, it's a great fertility machine. They're quiet, they improve soil. Can't say enough about worms. You can make, if you make compost, then you can make compost extract. Compost extract is simply compost that you put in a bucket with water. So maybe in a five gallon bucket, maybe you put two gallons of compost in there and fill up two gallons of water, stir it around for a few minutes, let it sit for 20 minutes, pour it off through a strainer, and then you can water your plants in with it. Very easy. And it makes a huge difference in your garden. This compost has all kinds of good stuff in it, but when you make this compost extract, you're, you can pull off the uh, humates, the fulvic acids, humic acid, um, and the plants and soil really respond to that. Your other option could be chickens, Lots of uh, traditional victory gardens had chickens in them, actually. Um, and it was a great idea because the plan was to rotate. And one year, and this is a small garden, but imagine one year you would have, you have two plots. One plot has chickens in it with a fence. And that entire year, you keep the chickens in there. And the other plot has vegetables and you grow your vegetables out. The next year, you flip that, and you put your chickens into the vegetable plot and raise them in there for a whole year. Now you're gonna to have to do things like deep litter system, where you can add straw, you could add leaves, food scraps, the chickens will scratch in there, and they'll just improve all that. Um, and this is a way, this was a traditional way in um, many parts of the world of keeping fertility up. And certainly in victory gardens, this was a way to keep the fertility up and always have high fertility, always have protein from your chicken eggs. If you had to eat meat, um, you didn't have anything else and certainly you can harvest your chickens. And 
and you just keep rotating. It's a perfect, really a perfect system. Um, rabbits are great. We kept rabbits for years and years and years at our homestead. Um, we never actually uh, slaughtered and ate any of our rabbits. Our rabbits were Angora rabbits and these great fluffy, huge rabbits that my wife would pull off. You can pluck, actually, you can pluck the, the hair, the fur, the fibers off of these rabbits, the wool, I guess you would call it. Um, and the rabbits are so lovely, especially with kids. Um, in a fenced in area, we, would we were able to just take them out of their cages and they could run around the yard. Um, but they are the perfect fertility machine. Rabbit poop is, is equivalent to cow manure in nutrients. And it's very good. It's one of the best manures there are. Um, we designed our rabbit area where we had worm bins underneath. So the rabbits would poop, fall down into the worm bin. The worms would take care of it. And we had chickens and we could let the chickens into that. The chickens could scratch, they could harvest worms. Um, it works great. You could try quail um, in the right setting. Some people have great luck with uh, ducks and other animals. So I really want you to think about your fertility. It's so important. This is the way things used to be produced. And in the future, this is how things will be produced. We will not be able to buy bagged fertilizer or um, components like that in the future. It's going to be more expensive and more difficult. So it's better for us to take care of our own fertility. And that's certainly what regenerative farming is. Um, and that's a big difference than what organic farming is. Organic farming can be the same thing. You can certainly produce all your own fertility, but it could also, you could be an organic farmer and you could bring in fertility from the outside. And I think as a holistic thought process, it's so important to enliven your farm to the degree where you're building your own fertility on your farm. You're closing those loops. You're saving money by doing that. And you're building this farm organism that is so strong, is so fertile, your ecosystems on your farm are improving, you're holding more water, your soils are improving, and that's, that's really what it's about. It's not just sustaining what we have. It's at this point, we have to think about how can we improve our farms? And I really think, you know, we're doing it. We're certainly doing it on our North Farm. Um, you go out there, we go out there and we, we look out and we, we dig into the soil. It's so sweet now after the past five years. Everything is improving. The weeds are lessening. Plants are growing better. It's, it's a process, but it's a worthwhile process. Well, I wish we didn't have to deal with weeds. Um, farmers have sure been into a long battle with weeds and it takes a lot of time when you farm to control your weeds but we need to look at weeds a little differently and weeds are nature's response to how we work the ground so nature never leaves a piece of ground bare if we go and till open a piece of ground Sure enough, a week or two later, there'll be thousands of seeds popping up. Nature wants to cover that. That's nature's way of healing a disturbance. And weeds really can tell us a lot about our soils. There's a great book, Pfeiffer Has, Weeds and What They Tell. And you can use the weeds that grow on your farm or your garden 
as an indicator um, of soil health, soil compaction, um, plant health. Weeds will really tell you a lot about your farm. So we need to maybe stop battling them as much and, um, and just realize that part of the problem is we're creating it by trying to keep open space and we need that space covered. So we're either going to cover it with plants, we're going to cover it with mulches, um, you know, tarps, things like that when we're trying to kill off weeds. Um, but when we plant, one thing that we can do is we can stagger our plantings, one here, one here, one here, one here. And we stagger them in such a way to where they grow out and fill in that there's no sunlight getting beneath the plant. And that prevents a lot of the weeds from germinating if they don't get sunlight. And our crops can take up that space. Um, Uh, the major forms of weeding that we're going to have to deal with with your with our gardens or farms we're gonna we're gonna start you know by hand and anytime you can tackle your weed problem early when the weeds are just the germ that's the time to do it um, really if you can stand there above your soil and you can see the weeds sprouting, it's almost too late. You can still take them out and you could still handle that, but it's better to go in there when they're very tiny and weed that top layer very thinly so you're not bringing up more weeds from the seed bank. Weeds will last um, years and years and years. Um, Many weeds will last, weed seeds will last 50 years in your ground. Johnson grass, it'll last 50, more than 50 years, the weed seeds in your ground. So if we foul a piece of land by not taking care of it and the weeds take over and they proliferate, they, they, there, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds per plant. Some plants have a quarter million seeds or more. Purslane has a quarter million seeds. One plant can grow a quarter million seeds. So it's very important to take care of our lands and keep them covered and not let noxious weeds take over because if you have a fouled piece of ground and then you're going in there to clean it, you can't expect your next crops to come out clean because you're gonna have a lot of weed pressure. So weeds, you know, anytime you're having to do things Besides planting and harvesting, it's really taking away the energy and time that you have to grow crops. But it's one of the things that we have to deal with. Um, weeds are a real teacher. Weeds teach us a lot. Weeds teach us so much. You can eat your weeds. There's tons of weeds in the garden that are good for you. Purslane, like we talked about, some people call that a weed. Chanopodium, lamb's quarters. Um, Gallon soga, there's, there's so many weeds that are high in nutrients and are great. Eat your weeds. Compost your weeds. Feed your weeds to your chickens. All great ways to deal with your weeds. So, we, everything we do, we want to think about increasing our yield. And we've talked about this already a little bit, but the double row, the, the putting plants close together and staggering them. Often if you have old time farmers would plant a single row of crops and have a path and another single row of crops and a path and repeat, well, like we talked about before, there's so much path space that is devoted in that scenario. It's essentially 50% of your ground becomes path. So what we've done 
if we, we've made our beds bigger, and instead of a single crop in that row, now we've got a double row. Or sometimes we have a triple row. With our spring crops, we can easily fit three rows in one three or four foot bed. You can put four rows of carrots in a bed. With our garlic, we, we run four rows in our beds. So never do a single row unless you have to. Always do a double or triple row. Um, lettuces, radishes, things like that, you can get up to six or eight rows per bed. So essentially you're just by putting two rows in one bed and eliminating that path space, you've essentially just doubled your yield in that same space. Very important. Intercrop. Which way? To the right? Intercropping's great. Um, growing different kinds of crops. We talked about that with the three sisters. You've got the corn and then the pole beans going up and then the squash on the ground filling out. Um, it could be a great one that the Italians did and Rocco here on the farm has done and Pat's done is growing um, fava beans, growing two rows of fava beans they're very early crop. You can grow those early and then you could plant tomatoes in between. And by the time the fava beans are finished, you just push those over. They're a nitrogen fixer and they'll basically mulch your beds and the tomatoes can take over. So that's a great way of doubling your yield in that space. Under sowing, talked about this with clover already. You can under sow a lot of crops. Um, Purslane there again, it's a great one. Corn patches or um, different. Last year we had a lot of purslane that popped up under our onions. And it, it really doesn't compete. It's a very low, low crop. You have the onions that just keep growing upwards in this low crop that spreads out and takes over that area. It's a great one. Companion plant. Um, a lot of people like the companion plant. There's a book called Carrots Love Tomatoes. Um, I think companion planting is great, um, especially when you think about root zones and this taking up this vertical space, how you can mix more plants into it. It really makes a lot of sense. It's, the vertical gardening is great. Um, Trellising, yeah. We can trellis on the edge of our garden. We can grow grapes up it. We can grow all kinds of vines. And that vertical gardening can just allow us to have more space because we just take it vertically. We've already talked about watering, but watering will certainly double your yield. Getting your fertility right will double or more your yield. It's very important. We've talked about edges a bit, but edges are super important in your garden. And especially garden and farm, edges are very important. Edges are where all the magic really happens. Edges are these, these complex, complex habitats where there's one system that bleeds into the other system. Often it's a tree line beside a creek or a river, or an edge could be the side of a hill into a field. And it's that little space in between that a lot of the magic happens. Um, coming down the hills, and right at the base, there's fertility that's always falling and 
is collecting in the bottom there. Um, I can't say enough about edges. Edges are something that people don't appreciate often enough, but there are borders and boundaries. And we'll get more birds, um, all kinds of species really love the edges. So we want to bolster our edges on our farms. We want to bolster our edges in our gardens and especially our victory gardens. Very important to do that. We can grow natives in the edge. Uh, we can grow woodland medicinals in the edge. A lot of our homes in this area were cut from a piece of mountain land that used to have medicinal plants and native plants. And often the home site is kind of in the middle and the edge is still a remnant of what it used to be. And there may be poplar trees, maples, oaks, um, and in that little bit of habitat, if we expand it slightly, we could start to plant back into it some of these um, woodland medicinals. Very important. We can plant um, in this area some of the traditional woodland medicinals are ramps, ginseng, uh, golden seal, cohosh, all sorts of plants that we can harvest um, and get that have medicinal qualities or that we can just grow them to replace the habitat that's been lost. A lot of these plants are so rare and have been um, poached and over harvested that really I think it's not we're not going to necessarily see them come back to life in the woods. Um, we, we may have better control in our own yards and it probably because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have houses and yards, it's probably a great thing to do is to start planting these medicinals back into the yards. And I think we can repopulate whole areas with woodland medicinals if we do that. Edges provide privacy. Depending upon the way the world's trending, these edges could provide security. Um, often the best thing to do starting our garden is to fence, fence in our piece of land and to really kind of hold that boundary to be able to grow crops along that edge. Edges are certainly a, a very valuable source of organic matter and we see that trees that grow on the edges shed their leaves yearly um, and those leaves all that's incredibly valuable for our gardens and the eco habitats and our lands so seeds are seeds are incredible we've talked about purslane and other plants how many seeds per plant i went and dug through some of our uh some of the seeds that I've saved the past couple years here at the farm. I've got all kinds of seeds here. Seeds are so prolific. This is arugula. This is what we have left. Doesn't look like much. Arugula is such small seeds. This is enough probably to plant two acres of arugula right here. Very valuable. Seeds are going up in price and are hard to get. Very valuable to be able to collect and save your own seed. What else do we have here? Celery. Anybody like to grow celery? Some people say not to grow celery because supposedly it takes more calories to eat celery than it's worth. But there again, nutrition wise, celery is very dynamic. It has um, lots of things in it that we need other than just calories. This is celery seed. This is just a tiny bit of celery seed 
Well, it's not a tiny bit of celery seed. This is a lot of celery seed, but this is a tiny bit out of our stash here. And these seeds are so incredibly small. They're just incredibly small. There's a big celery craze, John. It was meant for me. It was a big celery craze, right? So it's millions more people drinking celery. So yeah, celery juice, so good for it's you. It's a huge craze. It's, it's a huge. Craze. It's very good for you. It celery, celery salts, yeah. Celery salts are very special. You sell, save your own celery seed. You smell that? It's just like celery salts. It's very good. Um, this is tens and tens of thousands of celery seeds here. And if you take seeds, you thoroughly dry them. You put them in a glass jar, label them. You can see here, Ventura. I like to label it. Because, boy, you really forget what you're doing if you don't. You think you're going to remember, but you just don't. Um, I label on there where it was saved. It says Living Web Farms. It says number four. Number four is our greenhouse. And then it's got the year, 2020. So this is Ventura celery seed from 2020. And we haven't even put a dent into that. And I've got um, about half a gallon of this in the freezer. Properly stored seed will last almost indefinitely um, in the freezer. Put in, if you store it when it's good and dry, put the lid on it, label it, put it in the freezer. This will last years and years and years. This saves so much money on a farm. And your plants become incredibly acclimated to your climate, to what you're growing, and often they grow twice the yield um, than plants that are not acclimated. So it's great. What else do we have here? Oh, I've got some Osaka mustard greens. These are super spicy. There's hundreds of thousands of seed in here. Um, it's quite incredible, actually. And this is just a this is just a little sample of a few things that I dug out. Oh, cilantro seed. Here's some cilantro seed. Oh, what's it say? Saved at the North Farm. Cilantro, 2020, Living Web Farms, right there. I've already planted some. Look at that. You don't have to clean it perfectly. Look at that. It still has some chaff in it. It's incredibly vital, incredibly important. So seeds, seeds have this X factor. The X factor is essentially an exponent. One plant can grow an exponent of itself. Um, Seeds are incredibly abundant. There is no lack of abundance here. We have everything we need. It's very simple. I don't want to oversimplify it, but I don't want to make it too complicated either. We have, like we talked about earlier, we have the energies coming into our land, and that's all free. The sunlight, the rain, um, the nutrients out of the air, the nitrogen. And with good soil and good seeds, everything is right there. It's a great system. It's very simple. You can trade seeds. Let me know in the chat if anybody wants to trade seeds. Anybody want some celery seeds? It's good stuff. You can, you can trade seeds. You can save money. You could actually sell seeds. It's possible at our Living Web store that we'll be selling seeds soon. You can save tons of money, and that, that's very important um, with this inflation that's not leaving us, is for us to figure out ways we can grow food and save money. And if we're having to spend lots of money on seeds every year, it doesn't really work. 
seeds and uh, seeds that you can't save. Um, you can still save seeds off of um, hybrids, but the the seed the plant won't come true. So it's very important to to save heirlooms and open pollinated seeds because you they will keep reproducing. It's very important that we have our own seed production because over the past couple decades, there's been monopolies that are buying out all the seeds. It's very important that we have our own seeds and don't get cut off from that. We save that money, the seeds are better, the plants grow better, it all works out better. It's very simple. And seeds, as this last one says, seeds are the basis of food security. You don't need a whole lot of tools, but you will need a few tools if you're creating your victory garden. Um, simple tools, essentially. And all this scales. So in my mind, the victory garden could be, could be a tenth of an acre, or it could even be your patio, and it could be patio plants. Um, they could be in pots. Or, you know, this could scale up to many acres. So I just want you to know, some people um, think that they need to go out. I've seen people who have a quarter acre think they need to go out and buy a tractor. It's just not true. You can do a lot by hand. Um, shovel, wheelbarrow, rake, garden fork. It's about all you need. Maybe a couple stirrup hose, a garden spade. And that you can, with that, you can grow a really great garden and feed your family. If you have, say, more than a thousand square feet, and this is just, this is just a rough kind of way of looking at it. If you have a uh, more than a thousand square feet, you may want to get a broad fork. You know, we're talking about appropriate tools, appropriate technology for the space. Um, but I don't want you to spend a ton of money on tools either. So we're going to go bare essentials, just what you need to get the job done. A wheel hoe. So when you're weeding or you're putting in rows, you can use the wheel hoe and the wheel speeds things up quite a bit. It's a 10x as opposed to hand weeding. So maybe if you have a thousand square feet, maybe 5,000 square feet, you know, wheel, hoe, broad fork, you can get by with that. Um, a walk behind tractor can be handy. I um, would rather um, probably not use a walk behind tractor just because I think you can do, depends on your energy level and how much help you have and how long you've been doing it, but you can certainly do more. You can do a quarter acre or more by hand still. Um, but I don't want you going out and rushing out and buying, you know, walk behind tractors or tractors or anything like that. But just thinking about it scale wise, you really wouldn't need anything like that on less than a quarter acre, maybe an acre. And you really don't want to use a walk behind tractor. That's why I don't like it. It's because it's, it's a specific niche that it fills. Um, once you get over an acre, a walk behind tractor is not very useful. It's just too small. If you have it over an acre, you know, a tractor, you can certainly use that. But um, the other tools you would need to help get you through the, the season the, are the season extenders, cold frame. Um, plastic, greenhouses, uh, things like that, um, remay, fabric that we put over our plants, all those will extend your season. And it's very important to grow crops in the, in the winter. Um, that can be some of the easiest crops to grow. You have to manage Maybe you have to manage your covers, but as far as fertility, weeds, and watering, 
you don't have to worry about any of that. And then you can harvest greens all winter very easily. Okay, I promised you that we would use my mom's um, garden as an example. And one reason I wanted to use it is because it, it, it's a garden I know very well. We installed it ourselves. Another reason is it really demonstrates a lot of these techniques that we've been going over tonight. Um, and another reason is the Victory Garden for my mom means a lot. Um, my mom was born in 1943 in Netherlands, in the Netherlands. And she was born into what they called the uh, um, hunger winter or starvation winter. That was a very rough, dark time. Um, and this, in some ways, this is kind of, um, this family story kind of sticks with you. And family trauma, you know, with science, we're seeing that that sticks with generations. And people who have been, have gone through hard times and have trauma and, um, you know, that, that plays out over many generations. And she's always had a garden. And when she, um, she immigrated here when she was 12. But up until then, her family and a lot of families in um, Europe had what they call an allotment. An allotment was just a small plot out in the country that people would go and garden. And pretty much everybody had to have an allotment to survive. There was no food. Um, and that was the only way you were going to survive is to grow your own food. And even for many, many years after, um, there was scarcity and rationing. And um, the victory garden for them was very important. And it was her, her grandparents had a victory garden and everybody around had a victory garden. So when she came over here and, and got of age, her and my dad, they ended up getting into the back to the land movement. And that really influenced me. And I think part of why they got into that was because of that wanting to do better, seeing that you have to support yourself. And also a big push for the back to the land movement was inflation in the 70s. Um, and here we are again, high inflation. And it just makes sense. There's so many reasons it makes sense. So let's look. This is a, obviously a bird's eye view here. Whoops. Um, and this, this, let's see if I could draw this. Okay. Let's see. Uh, this is her piece of land is right here. So. I'll zoom into it, and then we could look at it. It's a, just a small piece of land. She got this house in 2008-2009 in Asheville. And it was, it's a nice, fine house, but there was, like most houses that are built, there is nothing, nothing was taken into account for the yard. The yard was horrible, and it had a terrible slope, and you couldn't do anything on it. And where the car is there, that's uh, essentially beside the garden there. Um, and we ended up building this garden up. Oh, let's see. Oh, is it zooming? There we go. So it's zooming in here. And this is early in the season before a lot of things were planted out. And her plot is mostly there to the left. And this plot doesn't have a lot of head spaces, doesn't have a lot of um, paths, and is all edged with perennials. So it's a, it's a great 
example of what you can do. This is Greta. Here's my wife. This is must be uh, maybe two, 2011, 2012, something like that. We were just installing the garden here. Everything was dirt. Um, had a terrible slope down to her house, and we had to put a wall in to terrace it. And this is first year in her garden. So there's some key things I'd like to point out here. Um, you can see the fence that we put up around it. It's very important. Before she had a fence, it felt like no man's land out there. Her and her neighbor's house are so close that no one really knew whose piece of property was whose, and they didn't really want to interact, and there weren't clear boundaries, and it's just, it's an odd situation when you don't clarify your boundaries and what you're doing. And with good design, you can do that. We put a fence along it, and this fence became a spot um, for all this edge space. So we were able to put perennials along the fence. Um, this is south-facing garden, and her house gets very hot there. So we planted along the south wall, which is beside her house there, we planted those arborvitae. You can see them, those small kind of conifers there. And those get nice and vertical, provide some kind of architecture um, element, and they provide some really nice shade along the house. In between that, we planted figs. And you could see, I think you could kind of make out, going downhill, it steps down here. Steps down, 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 farther you go. It just keeps stepping down. So we went with contour to harmonize that piece of land so the rain didn't wash down through there. It's really important. You can see right here, there's beans growing up it. She's got greens in the garden. Um, this, we planted clover in the past. There's clover in all the paths, and everything was undersown. There's lots of good little demos here about what you can do. This was next spring. Uh, we planted that edge with nanking cherries, and they create a fantastic hedge um, that you can lop back at a certain height if you wanted to. They're very vertical and they don't spread out too wide. So you have this, this nice kind of privacy border around your garden. And then this is the area in between her, her neighbor's house and her house. And this was the fence there. And um, this is a couple years on and these are grapevines. So we put the uh, fence up and the fence works as a trellis. And we planted Concord grapes there. And the grapes absolutely went ballistic. They have produced so much fruit in that area. And she has harvested over and over and over again. Uh, fruit off of that and it's been great it's been a real bonding uh, with her neighbor because they moved in and they had an instant garden and they were able to harvest all the fruit that grew on their side so it's you're building community right there working with your neighbor and that's really in these times that's one of the most important things we can do is to start building relationships with our neighbor Getting outside, growing a garden is all about relationships, and we're going to need each other. We're going to need neighborhoods. We're going to need communities. We're going to need friendships, and the garden is the easiest way. It's so easy to get friends if you have food. Everybody loves it. It's exciting. There's lots to talk about. You can give food away. 
it's it's great. Um, this I wanted to demonstrate. This this is her fertility machine. Now you can't really tell, but this is her compost area. Is behind this little um, block of wood here. She's got compost bins in this area, stacked in there, and she can actually from her porch she can go dump her coffee grounds in the compost bin. She doesn't have to get off her porch. And then the figs growing beside the compost love it. Um, they've gotten so huge growing beside the compost. So this is, this is a couple more years into it. And this is the arborvitae. You can see these arborvitae get nice and tall. They kind of look like these Italian cypress. Um, and they're really beautiful. But they're they're pretty fast growing, but not fast growing as, as these figs here. You can see how fast these figs are growing. And the figs really grew up, filled in that space in between, and shaded out her house a little bit, cooled things down in that area. And then she's got this whole great crop of figs and perennials on the edge so her entire garden is ringed with perennials so she gets food you know you plant once and you have to tend some but you don't have to do a whole lot you get that food year after year the figs have because they're up against that south wall they've put on so many figs um, it's hard for her to keep up with them i think she may have like eight or nine fig trees there bushes and they've gotten um, they've gotten up to 12 foot tall. So these are just um, uh, the turkey, brown turkey figs. These are not the Chicago hardy. These have done fine in our region. I think uh, it's a matter of putting them on the south or southwest wall and they'll survive great. This is a, just a great little, this is creeping time. So. This is the walkway going to her porch and in between the cracks she planted some creeping thyme and now this creeping thyme is just is so prolific and it's taken over um, the cracks at least. And it's great. You walk on it. It's aromatic. It's beautiful. If you want to season your your tomato sauce or something like that, or your meatballs, whatnot, go get a sprig of thyme. It's easy. It's at the base of her stairs there. It's great. Here she is planting those, or harvesting figs. So many figs. And so this garden for her has, has been incredible. She has, I've witnessed this, She's 80 years old almost now. She's out there every day. She's getting all the health benefits of her garden. She's eating from her garden nearly every day. She's giving food away. When she's out there, the neighbors stop by and talk to her. People are going down the road, asking questions with these figs you can take endless cuttings and create more figs. With the grapes, you can take cuttings off the grapes, create endless amounts of grapes. With the Nanking cherries, you can take cuttings, you can root them. So it's, it's just, it's so prolific. The garden is so prolific. It's about good design though. It's about setting it up right and having good design. The middle of her garden is all annuals. Um, and she plants lots of lettuces and tomatoes, and then the edges, even under the figs, she's got herbs, and before they filled in, she would grow um, arugula and lettuces, strawberries, and things like that. Um, and so you're, we're, we're stacking those layers. We've got the vertical garden going and we're just stacking those layers. She's improved her soil all along the way. She keeps it covered. 
either cover crops or um, she often she covers with with um, coffee sacks. So she gets these coffee local coffee roasters have a lot of these coffee sacks, and she she uses them in the paths and sometimes in the beds to to uh, prepare them for planting. And it's very simple, but she's harvested tons of food. She's hosted parties there. Uh, my youngest brother, he had his wedding reception out there, and it was just happened to be the time when the Concord grapes came in. And it was just like, she went out and harvested, and it was like the theme of his wedding reception were these grapes because they were just so prolific and beautiful. And she made these wonderful uh, bunches and displayed them. And it's just, it's all positive. There's really no downside to creating your victory garden. So to me, one of the most important things are, is, the, is the idea of the garden as a community builder. I think we are certainly going to need each other more and more, and um, we become fragmented. And generally in societies where there's high inflation, um, scarcity, that's the time when people need to work together because things can be grim and dim. And if we work in our communities and start bolstering them now, then we can kind of change that tie to a certain degree, at least locally. You know, it's really about us working. We can't change the entire world like that. But all we can truly do is, is work on ourselves and kind of these concentric circles outward. And these circles, the more you work on yourself and your home and you build a garden, I've seen it firsthand many, many times. A garden will transform a family. And when a family is transformed by eating the good food, they're out there spending a couple hours on it a day or an hour, it, it's magnetic. And then the neighbors start to ask about it. And then they want to grow a garden. And so it's a great way of of connecting and it's a great way of, of um, telling stories and having friends. Food is full of stories and every culture has these beautiful stories of food and when you're out in the garden people will come and tell you their favorite recipe or how they use this ingredient and it's just it's a common thread that um, we, we really need to start to weave back in. Um, you can give seeds away to your neighbor, you can give plants away, you can teach them how to grow. It's very important. These kind of things we can bolster and we can organize in this way and we can do it very grassroots and work our way up. The old Victory Gardens were kind of um, the opposite approach. Um, it was about government trying to foster victory gardens to be successful and patriotic. But what they found was most people polled or surveyed really didn't care about the patriotism aspect as much as inflation. People need to eat. People need to be able to afford to eat well. So that's what it's all about. Um, seeds are stories, food is stories, recipes are stories. Very great way to have a community builder. Okay, so the nitty gritty. We've gone through it. We are going to, before you do anything, I really want you to think about how you can define your goals and what you want to do for the season and long term. Whether that's the most simplest, I want to have a little patio garden and eat something every day, or I want to produce half of what my family eats or whatnot. But you want to set some goals about what you would like to create. Um, and you want to clarify these. 
And over time, you can, you can keep clarifying your goals. They may change, and that's great. We want to assess the site. You want to have that big picture view. You want to take the whole site in. You don't want to get just narrowly focused in one little spot. You want to take it all in and start to read the land. It's very important. You want to assess it, and then you want to start working on your design. And this may be something that you need to implement over seasons. So you may need the long plan and the short plan. And they'll have to work together, but you're going to bite it off in manageable pieces because you're going to have a very specific plan. And the most important thing is to get food in the ground now. And there's never a bad time, no matter what time of year, to start a garden. Every month of the year, you could plant radishes. Every month of the year, you could plant arugula. Um, you can garden any month of the year. So if you're not ready yet, it doesn't matter. Right now, we're in the perfect time. We're at the beginning of May. Um, it, a lot of people were jumping the gun and going ahead in this area and planting um, their warm weather plants, crops out. Um, but truly, if you were to get a tarp on now, in your grass patch, in your lawn, and in four weeks, you could kill most of the grass and plant into it all your warm weather crops. You could plant your squash, your winter squash, your summer squash, your sweet potatoes, your tomatoes, your peppers, um, and you're right on time. So, but if you can't do that, it's never a bad time to start a garden. You're going to figure out with your with your um, plan. You're going to set out your planting dates. You're going to prepare your site. And this is very important. You're going to plant. And it's not enough just to plant once, but you want to continually plant. You want to have a succession of plantings. You want plants coming in at all seasons. You want plants that are you're harvesting and you're collecting seed off of, and then you have plants that you're also just putting out and you can eat. So it's you, you, you need this succession of plantings, um, and you're just going to keep planting. You have to spend some time each day maintaining, but not a whole lot. The garden, your victory garden, shouldn't take you more than an hour a day. It may take you... Um, you may spend a little bit more time in the beginning setting it up, but a very great way of kind of strategizing your time is to just, this is how my wife and I have done it for years, and it works great. We, in our home garden, we, we work all day, and then we come home, we cook dinner, and instead, and this takes some discipline, and it takes time to do this, but you clean up your dinner mess, and instead of sitting back and relaxing, that's when you head out. You head out to the garden right after dinner, and you spend that last hour or two out in the garden with your family. And that really bolsters a lot um, family connection, and just the fact of growing something and people seeing things grow and things coming to fruition um, is very good for people. It's very, it's very good for your mental health. It's good for your physical health. It's, it's, it's a very good thing. But I like to see, and I talk about this often, but I like to see this as, especially this evening time, it's kind of like a little piggy bank. And you're putting that hour in each day. And you put another hour each day and at the end of the week at the end of the month you've put all that energy into it and you're you're going to be able to harvest and you'll have that reward from it it's great you'll be able to if you if you spend that hour you'll be able to plant and maintain um, your garden no problem 
the other thing I want you to do is to try to eat something from your garden every day. Um, every single day, eat at least one thing from your garden, even if it's you only have you only have oregano or thyme or something like that. Go out and just make it a habit at dinner time, getting a little bit and adding it, and then build on that. Just keep building on that. And then I want you to, I want you to eat from your garden every day, and I want you to certainly harvest, and harvest, harvest, harvest. Lots of people get burnt out. They put a lot of energy into the beginning of the season. And when I've seen this time and time again, when you're, you get into the midst of it and it's July, August, September, it's hot out there. A lot of people give up at that point, but that is when your summer crops are coming in and that's when you need to harvest because you're gonna harvest and you're gonna put those crops up and it's very important to preserve these crops. Anything you can preserve now, you'll be able to eat later. So you're, you're saving money. And it's often in the winter, if times get hard, that's when it's harder to survive. I don't wanna um, sound too glum, but I just, I just want us to have a reality check and know that this is totally positive and we could do something in the positive direction to protect ourselves and our family and our communities. So put up the food and then teach, 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 teach. Every one of us can be a teacher and we can start by teaching ourselves. We can get books out, we can learn offline, we can learn off of YouTube. Um, there's so much information out there and we can start to learn and then we can start to teach our family and to teach our neighbors and we can we can become a gardening expert. We can take this on as a career if we wanted to. So these are the most important factors. Get your site right. Get your fertility machine running. Water, weeds, and please save your seeds. We'll be back in just a little bit if you got any questions. Thank you.
Welcome back. Welcome back. Thanks for all the great questions. I'm going to go over your uh, questions and hopefully we can um, all learn something here. I, I truly think that um, the value comes in questions. So thank you for taking the time to write some questions here. Um, one question is, I'm interested in hugel culture. Do you have any concerns about ant or termite infestation? I think hugel culture is great. Um, there's plus sides and there's downsides to it. What we've seen here in this climate in Western North Carolina is what I've seen is when you practice hugel culture, hugel culture is basically um, you essentially take the topsoil away and you're going to take refuse wood, logs, sticks, and you're going to pile them in and make a bed and put topsoil back on top. And they work great for a few years, but what happens is the um, all the carbon in the logs rot away and it creates a lot of holes. And in these holes, rodents get in there. And um, when plants are grown in that, they grow great for the first year or two, but if plant roots don't have soil contact, they dry out, and when there's a lot of holes, you can get mole voles, you can get rodents, you can get rats, mice attacking your plants. So I like hugel culture, but I think we should, I don't know. I, I think it, I think in certain circumstances, it makes a lot of sense. I think it makes more sense maybe to transition um, a piece of property if you have uh, a lot of excess wood um, to make hugel culture beds and think about using them for a few years and then for me what I've done in the past is I've let those decompose when I haven't after the first two years I just let them naturally decompose and I call those uh, the fertility bank account because if you build your hugel cultures with enough wood in them and you come back in five or ten years, then all that wood is decomposed, and then it's full of carbon and is essentially your fertility bank account. Uh, next question. Paula says, what do you do with the grass when making a garden? Um, grass is great because you can compost the grass clippings. Grass is hard to kill by, so uh, um, historically, Victory Gardens, people have gone in with a spade and cut the top layer of sod off, and you could flip that upside down, and that will kill the grass and smother what's under it, and that's one method. Um, you, can, you can chop the sod, you could compost the sod, to get rid of it. But that, that top layer with that sod, there's lots of fertility in that. So the easiest thing um, is to put a, a tarp, some kind of cover on that, a silage tarp. And after about a month, the grasses die out. So if you could get your plot ready right now, you could just put your tarp down, pull it off in a month, and you've got beautiful friable soil, and most of your grasses are gone. Peter Ellis says, depends on what your perennials are, whether or not to have them in the middle of the garden or interspersed throughout. That's true. That's true. Um, I Generally, I, put, um, I do keep the middle open for annuals. Annuals will outproduce perennials um, by yields in that single year. Annuals put on lots and lots of pounds and yields, but the perennials take time. And if you put your perennials in the middle, then you have a harder time um, ever rotating your garden. And perennials, the very nature of them, you're going to keep them in whatever area that you plant them for a long time. So if you plant them on the edge, you don't have to disturb that space. Peter Ellis says, plastic cover. Um, Mulch, plus it actually provides fertility. Um, v Cooper 52 says, I want to grow herbs to sell. Is there, a suggest is, is there a suggested way to design a food forest 
that is also productive and helps with harvesting. Um, a food forest is a great way. Um, you could have your overstory of trees that will shade obviously underneath, and then you can grow these woodland medicinals underneath. So you essentially, yeah, you'll have your food forest. You can grow mulberries and different nut trees. And then depending upon your woodland medicinals, um, depending upon what you're growing, they'll, they'll like that. Um, a lot of woodland medicinals certainly can can grow under trees and under that under that food forest. Kelly Mueller says, "I switched to no-till three years ago, and no, my gravel clay soil is full of life and aggregation. Uh, using cover crops this fall, excellent." Uh, Peter Ellis says, "Crop selection is critical as well." If you're in an arid region, you don't necessarily have the luxury luxury of irrigation in that quantity. That's definitely true. Um, if you're in an arid location, then water is scarce, and then um, you need to grow appropriate plants for that area that don't require a lot of water. And that's where traditional crops, learning those crops um, will make all the difference and make sure your crops suit your climate. Yes. I'm more specifically talking about Western North Carolina. It's um, humid here, but it's cold. It's cold in the winter. We have four good seasons. Um, but this is, it's a great, great area to grow in, but it's, it's similar to a lot of regions in the earth, around the earth. Um, uh, Simon Jack said, add a lot of biochar to your soil too, so it holds more water and nutrients. That is true. Biochar will hold a lot of water and nutrients. Um, what we've found with our biochar is if you add just pure biochar without loading it first, and loading would be to preload it with nutrients. So that could be compost tea, that could be fish emulsions, compost extract, um, if you load that biochar, then you're preloading your nutrients in there. And biochar is just a sponge. I mean, there's more to it. It's a, it's a carbon sponge. But if you put biochar in your soil without preloading it, then essentially what happens is it's a sponge and it's sucking up nutrients in your soil and can actually lock those nutrients in the char and your plants can, um, your plants have a hard time with that actually. It's, it's better to preload it and then the plants in the soil can start to come to life and the biochar will really help it out in that way. Uh, Peter Ellis again, uh, we get around 32 inches of rain a year and it's fairly well distributed, but nowhere near an inch a week reliably. The challenge is us for using our, Peter Ellis says again, uh, the challenge for many of us is using our own compost for garden fertility, is that we simply don't have enough material. That's always the problem in growing your own fertility and making compost. Um, it's very hard to ever get enough compost, but the great thing is, is that your neighbors are always throwing away stuff, there's literally tons and tons and tons of leaves that make it to the dump every year. There's tree scraps that go to the landfill. There's food waste that go to the landfill. Peter, it's about collecting those streams, those waste streams into your garden area. And if you don't have enough around you, then you're gonna have to reach out a little bit further but it totally works. I've been making my own compost for 25 years now. You can do it. Um, there's a comment here. It says, I saw in South America, they kept all sorts of guinea pig type animals on garden patches. Any ideas. Uh, yes, guinea pigs in South America are great. I don't have any experience with that, but I know um, that's a traditional method and 
I think that they can fit that niche of the small animal. Um, it would be great. Peter Ellis says, how we define weeds matters as well. Absolutely. Weeds are just a plant that you don't want growing there. So biointensive planting is highly efficient in use of space and works to reduce weed pressure by giving them no space to get going. Peter, you're awesome. Uh, Peter also says, purslane is an excellent example of a not weed, a weed that is not a weed. Excellent nutritional food plant, good ground cover. Diego says, also weeds prosper on bacteria to fungal soil ratio. Yes. Yeah, you'll have less weeds when you get your fungal soil ratio up. It's very easy, especially in grasslands, pastures, to have more bacterial soils. And that's why it's very important to keep adding leaves um, we add wood chips to our perennial beds and the wood chips stay on top and those carbon sources really feed your soil and they bring that balance back and the fungal is an amazing element that produces all sorts of fertilizers. The fungal trades in their root zones, plants, they trade for sugars from plant roots and give plants nutrients that they couldn't have otherwise. So fungal is very important. Matt Lee says, what's the best way to add biochar I made into my no-dig garden beds? Well, that's a tough one if you're not going to dig it in. Um, so Matt, we talked about this. Preload your biochar and it is fine just to add it to the top and just keep growing cover crops and just add a little bit. If you want to fork it up just a little bit, I know it's a no dig bed, but if you fork it just a little bit, some of that works in. And eventually roots and worms and the action of the soil, biochar gets in there. It just starts to migrate and it'll work its way in there. Oh yeah, Matt says also, I just raked in some, but not very deep. That's fine. I think that'll work. It's better, I think, if you get it in deep, but not super deep. I think for water holding capacity, you would probably want it down, you know, a few inches though, if you're thinking about that. But biochar does a lot of things, so. Robert Rittenhouse, he said, I had to till for the first year, but I do not have a broad fork now as well but I do have a broad fork now as well. Yeah, you may have to till. It's not the end of the world to till the first year. A lot of people transition their gardens from grass or pasture to tilling that first season, and that's not a problem. It's, um, you've gotta do what you've gotta do, and it's efficient time-wise, but it definitely is not gonna improve your soil, and it's far simpler, I think, um, just to put a cover down and let the grasses and such rot out and plant right into it. Um, Peter Ellis, there are successful market gardeners with an acre in raised beds who are working without any mechanized equipment. That's true. Peter, I didn't want uh, this to be dogmatic. I was just trying to give kind of a general rule of thumb. You can do all sorts of things, Peter. Um, and if you take the time and you've got raised beds, this is a time thing over many seasons that these market gardeners have done this and they haven't needed a piece of equipment. I'm not telling you to get a piece of equipment. What I'm telling you is, is not to get a piece of equipment on too small of a farm. That's basically what I was trying to go over there. Uh, B. Cooper 52 says, if I terraced my slope land, how do I manage water runoff so that I'm not making the slope runoff worse? Um, your terraces are going to be angled back to the bank. And you actually want your terraces to be slightly crowned to where water will run off the edges. And eventually you can run them to the side of the property. You could run them to the wood line. Or you may have to have an area where it steps down to the next terrace and 
It could be a drain. Those are called chimney drains that go downhill. It can be rock that it runs off, or um, it may be the, like I said, the edge of your property and it could go into the wood line. Simon Jack says, what type of cherry did say was planted on the garden edge? I didn't quite hear what you said. It's a nanking, yes, it's a Chinese cherry. Um, and it's not a, it's a bush cherry. Um, very short stems. There's small cherry, but it's a, it's a great little, it's a great little niche plant. I really love them. Peter Ellis, man, Peter, you're all over it. Appreciate it. He says, thank you, John. Excellent presentation. You're welcome. Um, Aaron Justin says, incorporation with humanure, gray water reclamation gives me questions of historic practices. Certainly. Um, there's all sorts of great information out there about humanure, gray water, and I think we really need to be using gray water. Um, our own manures, I think, are best suited to, if we want to, people are using those for fertility and systems. I think that's generally best suited for the edges and the wood lines. We can, we can treat trees and things that have a longer cycle where those pathogens will not be a problem for us. And I think that's great. We need to start reusing and, re and using that. Uh, Space Grill says, are cardboard and hay a good combination for fighting weeds? Um, cardboard and hay are not a bad combination. Um, they're not bad at all. Uh, hay can have a lot of weed seeds in it, but hay can also be pretty good high in nitrogen. So, you know, it's kind of the uh, lasagna bed where you're building layers to cover it. So your cardboard goes down, and that's great. And then hay can go right on top. And I've done that many a time, and that works great. You can get some, um, you got to be careful where you get your hay from, essentially. You got to know where you're getting your hay from. There are uh, persistent, there can be persistent chemicals that are sprayed on hay crops. And those can last a long time, and you get those in the soil, and they can make growing um, tomatoes nearly impossible, beans, some other crops, um, very hard to grow with those persistent um, herbicides. And also, you can, you can bring in a lot of noxious weeds that way that grow in hay fields. So I'm all about using hay. You know, it's, it's all about whatever we can use, uh, whatever we have access to. We're trying to put waste ingredients to use. We're trying to make something good out of what was bad. I don't want you buying hay if you don't have to. Cardboard works great. Cardboard is free. You can use cardboard on your own, on its own. You can use cardboard with wood chips on top. Um, works great. Just don't incorporate the wood chips. Just cardboard, wood chips, you dig a little hole, you cut an X, you pull back the cardboard, you could plant right into it. You could do cardboard with leaves on top. That works great. Um, lots of different ways to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh shoot, John Mashey here. Hey John Mashey, what's going on? He says, awesome John. Uh, awesome job, John Henry. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a great class. Thank you so much, John. You're awesome. You've done so much for the gardening movement, and we love you here at Living Web. Thank you. Um, Aaron says, why doesn't every city block have a small farm? You know, I think that's a great idea. Um, I think one piece of that even more decentralized is why doesn't every house have a small farm? Or why doesn't every yard have a small garden? You know, 
this is all about trying to me it's important that we decentralize what we're doing with agriculture because a lot of our problems now stem from this over centralized system of agriculture and in the future we're finding decentralized um, systems are much much stronger than these huge monolith systems so if every block had a few gardens you know that's ultimate decentralization if we could in 1944, half of the food grown in America was grown in Victory Gardens. That's amazing. We can do that now. There's more of us. There's more, there's more yards that, are, that can be transitioned. And there's certainly more knowledge um, over the, well, maybe I take that back. We had a lot of knowledge in the past 100 years, but I think in the organic farming movement, we've really, uh, over the past 50 years, we've, we've taken it quite a ways here. So 50, 60, 70 years. We still have a long ways to go here, but there's lots more we can do. But decentralized is the way to go. That is the way of the future, from our water, to our currency, to our food, to our power. Um, all these systems, if they can be decentralized yet work together, they're very strong and robust. And that's, that's really what we need to do. Okay, well, that's all the questions I have. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in tonight. I hope you learned something. Let's all start a Victory Garden together. And please, please send in pictures. Tell us what you've done. We want to know. We really appreciate it. Let's do this. Thank you.